Thank you, Ruby. This morning I want to talk to you about walking by faith and trusting God. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 says, the just shall live by faith. And Paul quotes from Habakkuk in Romans 1.17. Again, he says, the just shall live by faith. It's very important for you and I to understand that God wants us to walk by faith. As a matter of fact, everyone in the Bible had to walk by faith. And one of the first examples is a man called Abram or Abraham. Now, I've heard many people say, you know, back in the old days, back in the days of the Bible, it was much easier to live, walk by faith than it is today. As I thought about that, I think it's much easier today to walk by faith than it was back then because we have so many good examples in the Bible. And the Bible teaches us a variety of things. So this morning I want to share with you three important truths that will help you to live a life of walking by faith. The first one is one must obey God to experience God's blessings. Now, I've heard many Christians say that they cannot see God's blessings in their life. And my question is usually this, are you doing what God told you to do? Now, if we're really truthful with ourselves, we must answer, probably not. We're not doing everything that God has told us to do. Now, some of us are from Arizona, or you've been in Arizona for a little while. And one of the great words in Arizona is, I'll do it manana. I'll do it tomorrow. I won't do it right now, Lord. I'll put it off for a little bit, but I'll do it later. Well, I wanted to share with you that on May 2nd, does everybody know what May 2nd is? It's a Thursday, and that's called the National Day of Prayer. And Pastor Sean wants to encourage each one of you to sign up. We're going to have a time of prayer here at the church. And it's going to be from 8 o'clock in the morning to about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Try to have eight hours of consistent prayer. And if you could sign up for half an hour to an hour, that would be wonderful. Now, some of you are saying, pray for half an hour? How in the world can I pray for half an hour? You know, I, I'm doing good if I get five minutes of prayer. Well, we have these little booklets, these are notebooks. We have about four of those. We can make up more. But it's for the day of prayer, and it begins starting out that uh, we begin worship. We have some scriptures here for you to read, and uh, you read through the scriptures. And then it comes based on, on Psalm, um, yeah, Psalm 139. It's in the bulletin. It says this, Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Well, you know, sometimes we just don't ask the right questions. And so we have the scriptures in here. We also have some little questions. And we have big print for most people. And uh, one, of this, one of the questions is, am I sinning the sin of prayerlessness? You have not because you uh, ask not. Okay? Uh, am I impatient? Am I irritable? <coughs> And so we have about, there's about 50 pages in here of questions that I don't want you to answer out loud. <clears throat> might embarrass you. But these questions are for you to think. As you ask the Holy Spirit to guide you as you go through this little booklet, it will help you to get cleansed of your sin. Because that's the idea is to become cleansed. Now, is there anything in my life that I would be willing, unwilling to give up for Christ? Uh, so we've got a variety of questions, and this is to help us to get right with God. Because most of the time, we just kind of fake it. And we say, well, I'm good enough. But we need to allow the Holy Spirit to kind of ask those questions and delve into our life. And if we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, we'd like you to sign up for half hour to an hour. And just walk through this little booklet. We hit, you said in different areas of the auditorium. So it's a time of quiet reflection as you go through that time of prayer. And I'll guarantee you, as you spend this time in prayer, it will make a difference in your life. 
and you will be glad that you did this time of prayer. And so we'll have at least four people in here, hopefully, each, each half hour to an hour. And we'll have that sign-up sheet either next week or the following week. But we're getting ready for the day of prayer on May 2nd. And we want to encourage you to be a part of that because it will make a difference. And it will, we'll try to help you to spend that hour or half hour in prayer. And it'll make a difference in your life. Now, again, you come back to one must obey God to experience God's blessing. I want you to look at this man, Abram. When God comes to Abram, how old is he? 75. How old is his wife, Sarai? She's 65. She's 10 years younger. Okay. They'd be a part of our church, wouldn't they? Isn't that wonderful? We can identify with them in a great way. Now, here are two senior adults, and God is asking Abram to leave his home and go to a place that he's never been before. Now, most of us can ex tell from experience that you moved, you enjoy moving. All those who like to move, raise your right hand. All those who hate moving, raise your right hand. All right, there, okay. Now, can you imagine Abram coming home to his wife, Sarai, and say, we're moving. And she's going to ask that wonderful question, where? And Abraham's response was, wherever God leads. And Sarah's response would be, uh-uh. <laughs> I want to know where we're going. I want some brochures from that place. I want some information about that place where we're going. But Abraham packs up everything, gets his, all his family together, and they head off, and they head to where God is leading them to the promised land or to the land of Canaan. Now, it's interesting as you look at that. I want you to notice verse 4. It says in verse 4, So Abram went as the Lord told him. Abraham did what God told him to do. Now, it's only when you do what God tells you to do that you'll experience the blessings of God. I can attest to that in my own life. I just graduated from high school, and I, God began to work in my life, and I knew I needed to go to Grand Canyon College. The only problem was I was living in Boulder, Colorado. And if anybody knows very much about Boulder, Colorado, that's where the University of Colorado is, where the Colorado Buffaloes uh, live. And it's a great college, great university. But God wanted me to go to Grand Canyon and so I left that day in August, and it was, it was about 50 degrees in, in Boulder. And I got on a plane, and I flew to Phoenix, Arizona. It was pretty nice in the plane. <laughs> got out of the plane, is over 110 degrees, and I knew I'd gone the wrong way. <laughs> it was unbelievable. I left cool, colorful Colorado to fly into hot, dry Arizona. But you see, I need to do what God told me to do. But that's been characteristic of my life, being obedient to do what God wanted me to do. I, I was pastoring in Parker, Arizona for 15 and a half years. My daughter had just graduated <clears throat> from high school. My son was going to be a senior in high school at Parker. And God called me to go to Carlsbad, California. Now, that was kind of an answer to prayer because Carlsbad, California is right on the ocean. It's nice and wonderful there. And uh, we'd gone shopping a couple times in Carlsbad and people were complaining when it got up to 80. Man, it's hot. <laughs> Had no idea what hot was really all about. But my son was decided to come with us, and so we moved over, and the only place we could find to live was in, in Vista, California, which is right next to Carlsbad, in that, that area. And so my son went to, had the opportunity to go to Buena Vista, Rancho Buena Vista High School, and he was playing football for them. He's a, because he's a senior, he got to be on the special teams, and they had an opportunity to play at, at De La Salle High School from Concord, California. Has anybody ever heard of that football team, De La Salle Hospital? In Concord, California. Now, if you haven't heard of that team, that was a team that had the longest winning record in football. 151 wins without a loss. 
And my son had a chance to play against those guys. And he played against them, and a couple of games later, he said, Mom and Dad, I, I want to go back to Parker. I want to graduate with the kids I grew up with. I want to be with my, my family back in Parker. So it was hard, but we allowed him to go back to Parker, and he graduated from Parker High School. So Chris and I experienced the empty nest syndrome. That was really difficult for a while, being in a strange place in California, but it's cooler. But doing what God wanted us to do. You see, sometimes when we do what God wants us to do, it's not going to be easy. It's not easy to move. It's not easy to pack up everything and get moved out. And then you get the place to get moved into your new place, and you look for things. You may have put it someplace, and somebody moved it. Or you forgot where you put it. And it's, it's really irritating. But that's part of doing what God wants you to do, being found faithful. The Bible says that Abraham went as the Lord told him. And that's why God blessed him. If you want to receive the blessings of God, then you need to do what God tells you to do. Be willing to go and do what God tells you to do. Secondly, I want you to notice, when you get to where God wants you to be, you must trust God. Now, I want you to notice that Abram arrived in the land of Canaan. And he comes to Shechem, and he built an altar there, and he worshiped God. And God said, this is the land I'm giving to you. This is your land. I'm giving it to your descendants. This is for you. Then the Bible says he went a bit farther south, went to a place where Bethel was on the west, that Ai is on the east, and he built an altar and worshiped there. And then verse 9 just kind of says that he, he went farther south, a little bit farther south, a little bit farther south, and then he went to the Negev, or he went down to Egypt. Now, I, I always wondered, why did Abram keep moving to the south? You see, he arrived in the promised land, and it wasn't what he expected. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, there was a famine in the land. And the last part of that verse 10, it says there was a severe famine in the land. How many times have you obeyed God? You've done what God wanted you to do. And when you got to the place that God wanted you to be, it wasn't what you expected. Wow. Wow. had a chance to go to Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary. And as I went to Golden Gate, one of the professors shared that it's so easy to get to seminary, and you think seminary is going to be a great time. Seminary is supposed to be like a revival. You have great preaching, great singing, and you just kind of sit there and just soak it all up and just allow all this great teaching come to you, and, and you're just there enjoying it. But that's not what seminary is about. Seminary, you know, they, they try to teach you how to read. I went to my church history class. Dr. Jack Manning was a professor there. He says, you've been to high school and college, but now we're going to teach you how to read. And boy, we read. We read and read and read. Not only did you have to read, but you had to do reports on what you read. Not only did you do reports, you had to do papers. You had to do a lot of other stuff, a lot of reading, a lot of tests, write papers, all that you had to do for higher education. And not only that, one had to work because you had to pay the bills. And so you're working 30 to 40 hours a week. You're going to seminary full time. And in seminary, they want you to be involved in a church. So you're working, involved in a church, and got a full load of classes. And you're doing all this, and you wonder where you find time to do anything. A lot of people get to seminary and they walk away and says, and they say, it's not what I expected. I didn't think it was going to be this hard. I didn't think it was going to be this difficult. And they walk away. Friends, I personally think that when Abram got to the promised land, he thought he had been deceived. You see, there's no famine back in Haran. 
there's no famine in Egypt. There's only famine in the promised land, in the land of Canaan. And he got to where God wanted to be, and he found a famine. And I wondered, why, why God, why would you allow famine in the land that you promised Abraham? Maybe God was testing Abraham to see if he was going to really trust God. And maybe that's why when we get to the place that we think that God wants us to be, and it's not what we anticipated, not what we thought it was going to be like, that God's testing us to see if we're going to trust God and stay where we are and be faithful to God. Or maybe God is humbling us to realize that we don't have all the answers. You know, you go to the doctor, especially with Joe Pembroke. She has these TIAs. They don't know what's causing it. And you go to the hospital, and they always say, well, we're running tests, but sometimes those tests are not conclusive. And you walk, wonder, what's going on? Why can't we find out an answer? And God's humbling us to realize that we don't know everything and that we have to depend upon him and trust him through those circumstances. Now, God did have a purpose in that situation, and God always has a purpose in each one of our situations. And it's obvious that Abram did not choose to trust God, but he chose to go to Egypt to find food for his family. And so he journeys out of the land of Canaan, the land of promise, and he goes down to Egypt. Well, my third point is, when you get to where God wants you to be, don't leave because you'll pick up stuff that you really don't want. I'm not sure if you caught all that. When you get to where God wants you to be, don't leave because you'll pick up stuff that you really don't want. Abram went to Egypt. Notice that Abram was not afraid when he came from Haran down to the promised land. There is no fear. He was doing what God wanted him to do. God led the way, and he did not have any fear. But as you read the rest of chapter 12 and a little bit farther, you'll find that when he starts going down to Egypt, he thinks this. Sarah, who's how old? 65? She's beautiful. And those Egyptians will kill me and take her for their wife. So Sarah, when they ask you if you're married to me, say, no, he's my brother. Just a little white lie, just a little thing, not too bad. You know, when you tell one lie, two or three other lies come about and cause you more problems in the end. But they just told a little lie. And so they get down to Egypt. And sure enough, Pharaoh comes and he says, is Abram your husband? She says, no, he's my brother. So Pharaoh takes Sarah into his harem. And then some problems come to his life. And Pharaoh realizes that he's got all these problems because of Sarah and Abraham. And he gets upset with them. And he tells them, you need to leave. And I'm going to give you some gifts with, so you can leave with some gifts. And he gave them some cattle, some sheep, and some slaves. He gave one female slave for Sarah to be her handmaid. Now, it's important that we understand that God is at work in our life. And Abram returns to the land of Canaan. It's been about 10 years, and Sarah is still barren. Now, it's a custom in the Canaanite area that if you don't have any children, that you would adopt a slave. And so Abraham decides he's going to adopt Eliezer of Damascus to become his slave and make that slave, Eliezer, his son. And he does that, and God comes to Abraham and says, no, that's not the way it's going to be. It's going to come through you. You're going to be the father. You're going to be father of many Nations, you're going to be the father of a multitude. And a couple more years pass, and Sarah's still barren. And so Abram and Sarah talk. And as they talk, they said, well, maybe it's not through me, Sarah says. Not through me, but maybe through my handmaid. And so she gives Hagar her Egyptian handmaid that she got while down in Egypt and gives her to Abram. And he has uh, sex with her, and she becomes pregnant. 
Ishmael was born. And God says, no, it's not through you and Hagar. It's through you and Sarah. 24 years pass. Abram is sitting by a campfire, and two men approach, and Abraham says, okay, let's make some food for you. And he feeds these two men, and they sit down, and they're talking, and these two men say to Abram, by this time next year, you're going to have a son, and Sarah's going to be the mother. Sarah overhears in the tent, and she begins to laugh. That's not possible. I'm only 90 years old. I can't have a child. And she does become pregnant. And she does give birth at 25 years later. Well, 20, not 25 years later, but when, when she's 90, she gives birth. I'll get that right. Now, God changed Sarah's name from Sarai to Sarah. And both those words mean princess. And God changed Abram's name to Abraham. And meant, Abram meant exalted father. Abraham means father of a multitude. Abraham would deeply regret leaving the promised land to go down to Egypt. Abraham realized that following Satan leads you to places you never intended to go and to do things you never intended to do. Isn't it like our life? We sin and we ask somebody, why did you sin? And they say, oh, I didn't intend to do that. It just happened. I didn't intend to go to that place, but it just happened. So following Satan can lead you to places you never intended to go and to do things you never intended to do. Also, I want you to realize that sin always keeps you longer than you want to stay, costs you more than you want to pay. And it makes a difference in your life. Now, Abraham learned the hard way that one must walk by faith. One must trust God each step of the way. And when you get to where God wants you to be, and it's not what you expected, you need to stay there and see what God does and how God will work a miracle in your life. Now, I'm reminded that God never promised us an easy life. He never promised us no pain, no problems, no difficulties. He only promised that he would be with us. And he says in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be with you always. In Philippians 4, 19, the Bible says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You see, in our day-to-day -day life, we get to places in our life, and we follow God, and we do what God wants us to do. And when we get there, sometimes it's not what we expect. We may find a famine. We may fa find problems. We may find health problems. We may find housing problems. We may find a whole bunch of problems. But it's at that time God says, trust me. I'll work with you and work through you to do a great and mighty work. We just need to be found faithful doing what God calls us to do. It's so important that we understand that God has a purpose for each one of us. And as he has that purpose for us, he wants us to use us to make a difference. Often in my life, I always complained when problems came my way. And then I began to understand that those problems give us an opportunity to live for Christ. So when others look at us, they can see us living for Jesus and doing what Jesus wants us to do. And we are an example for our neighbors and those around us. Whether you understand this or not, the neighbors you live around, they hope that you have problems because they want to see problems in your life to see how God deals with you. And as he deals with you, it helps you go through those problems that makes a difference in their life. And if God can do a miracle in your life, then it's possible that God can do a miracle in their life. And so when problems come your way, we have the tendency to be upset and angry with God. But God has a purpose for those problems, and he wants you to trust him. 
He wants you to depend upon him and walk by faith. Today I want to encourage you to walk by faith and not by sight. It's not that easy to do. But we have the example of Abraham. We have the example of Paul. We have the example of other Christians who have done similar things, who have gone through difficult days, and they've seen God at work in mighty ways. You've heard of Corrie Tamboon and the struggles that she went through as a Jew in, in Germany. You've heard about other people who have gone through struggles, and they are a light and a testament that God is at work in our world, and he wants to make a difference in the people's lives around you. So when problems come our way, we need to ask the question, what is God trying to teach me? And what is God trying to do to use me to reach those people around us? You see, God has called us to be a light to those who are in darkness. And God wants us to be a shining light of what God can do in each and every one of our lives. You know, we need to be a light so other people can know how they can get right with God. How can you get right with God? You need to admit that you have sinned, that you've done what you wanted to do rather than what God wants you to do. You need to believe that Jesus is God's son and that he can save you. You need to confess your sins to God. And the Bible says if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then you need to call upon the Lord. You need to invite Jesus to come in your life and heart. He's not going to force his way into your life. He wants you to invite him to come into your life and heart to become your Lord and Savior. And then you need to do his will. I love the story of Abraham because I can identify with Abraham. I get to the place where God wants me to be. It's not what I expected. And there's a challenge there. But God challenges us to trust him. Abraham messed up. We mess up. But we can still trust God because God is faithful. And when you walk by faith and not by sight, you see the faithfulness of God. In just a moment, we're going to have an invitation and invite you to come forward and make that decision that you need to make this morning. God has been dealing with you, and you may be upset because things have not gone the way you wanted to go. You may be upset because you got to where God wanted you to be, but it's not what you expected. Hang in there and realize God's still at work, and God has placed you where you are for a purpose to bring glory and honor to him. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you this morning, we want to thank you that you're an awesome God who loves us and cares for us. You're a God who knows who we are. You know where we are. You call us by name, and you lead us. You lead us to the places that you want us to be, to be an example for those around us. Yes, you allow difficult times to come. You allow things to happen in our life, but you always have a purpose. So help us in those difficult times to trust you and depend upon you and see you work in a mighty way. Thank you for your love, your mercy, and goodness. And Lord, help us to live a life walking by faith and trusting you and to be an example to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we stand and as we sing the invitation, I invite you to make a decision. Some of you may need to join this church. Some of you need to invite Jesus in your life and heart. Some of you may just need to come and pray. But we want to give you an opportunity to do that. Don't put it off. Don't say, I'll do it tomorrow. Do it now while God speaks to you. You come as we sing. Yeah.
shed his precious blood, rich blessings to bestow. Once now into the crimson flood that washes white as snow. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. save you. He will save you. He will save you now. I want to thank you for being here this morning. hope it has been helpful and encouraging to you that God is with us no matter what happens and he'll use us in a very special way. I remind you to be back tonight at six o'clock for our time of family share and it'll be, you'll be blessed with that service. Also, uh, be in prayer for uh, Joe Pembroke and also uh, Rod Thompson and many others. Uh, God is good all the time, and he's going to help us and sustain us. At this time, I'm going to ask Jay Cameron if he closes in a word of prayer. Jay? Heavenly Father, our participation in this service this morning has placed in our hearts and our minds an uplifting of your divine spirit that we've prayed for and hoped for. Lord, as Pastor Har has said this morning, things happen to us. A lot of times we just don't know what's ahead of us. But we do know as we leave here that with your divine spirit in us, we know that our relationship with you is solid, secure, and dependable. Lord, we thank you for listening to us and for comforting us. Comforting us and listening to us through our fears and our uncertainties. Through our challenges that we face each day. And also, as we feel your, your divine presence here in us right now, let this feeling stay with us as we leave this sanctuary, being shining examples of your glory. We ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.